Good evening and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Behind the Headlines. Uh, this is going to be a different program uh, because I have no co-host. The format will be different as well, but hopefully we'll be able to educate and inform you regarding one shocking incident that happened over the weekend. So over the weekend marked the 107th anniversary of the signing of the Balfour Declaration and this was the British government recognising the Jewish people's right for the first time to a homeland in their ancient covenant territory which is the land of Israel and uh, sadly we see that members belonging to the Palestinian Action Group um, broke into the chemistry department at the University of Manchester. They smashed and grabbed two busts belonging to Haim Wiseman. Now Haim Wiseman was not only uh, a professor of chemistry at the University of Manchester he was also one of the leaders of the Zionist movement. He helped to establish the Jewish Agency, uh, which was the forerunner for the modern state of Israel. And in 1948, he became the first president of the state of Israel. Uh, an incredible individual um, who really did advance the movement towards a Jewish state uh, through his incredible political work that he did with the British government when he was a professor at the University of Manchester. So we see that the Palestinian Action Group carried out uh, this horrific attack on such a, a cultural and historical uh, Jewish icon, such as Haim Wiseman. We also saw that over the weekend, they also attacked the offices of the Jewish National Fund and together with the uh, organization known as BICOM, the British Israel um, Communications Media Research Organization that looks to uh, educate and inform the media in this country about the importance and significance of Israel. And of course, what we saw with the stealing of the two busts of Haim Wiseman from the University of Manchester is an unprecedented rise in Jew hatred that we've seen since October the 7th. It's not only our British a Jewish community that are suffering this huge rise in Jew hatred, but we also feel that uh, Jewish students on campus are also suffering. And so let's have a look now at this excellent report uh, produced by our friends at CBN looking into the trouble of Jew hatred on campus. On Columbia's campus, Jewish students endured threats with calls to go back to Poland. Here, a demonstrator points at pro-Israel students while holding a sign that reads, All Qassam's Next Targets. And a Jewish professor is denied entry to the campus while school officials look on. I am a professor here. I have every right to be everywhere on campus. You cannot let people that support Hamas on campus and me, a professor, not go on campus. Let me in now. Meanwhile, other Columbia faculty members join protesters chanting Free Palestine and calling for the school to divest from companies selling weapons to Israel. Demonstrations growing more radical have Jewish students fearing for their safety, leading one rabbi to tell students to stay away because the school can't protect them. I was there today and it, it made me sick hearing the things they were saying and doing. Um, so over this holiday, I kind of just want to try to avoid it as best as I can for my own safety. Monday, the school went to online classes only as New York Governor Kathy Hochul came to see the situation firsthand. Students are scared. They're afraid to walk on campus. They don't deserve that. But I've never seen a level of protest that is so person to person. It is so visceral. And I'm not calling on everyone. People need to find their humanity. Have the conversations. Talk to each other. Protests, however, spread to other schools in the Northeast. Monday night at NYU, police clashed with protesters while making arrests as they tore down a tent encampment. At Yale, Police arrested 45 students for trespassing as their peers celebrated them as heroes. Pro-Palestinian students at MIT have declared part of their campus a liberated zone. While at Harvard, officials shut down Harvard Yard until Friday to prevent similar protests. The reaction is simply a horror. Rabbi Moisha Hauer told CBN News it needs to be stopped. It's been happening in one place after the other at different degrees, and if it's not addressed, properly and efficiently, it will, it will continue to grow. 
if they're doing things which break the law, they should have consequences as defined by the by the law. But they must have consequences. The answer can't be, we spoke to them. Monday, President Biden condemned the anti-Semitic protests while also condemning those he says don't understand what's going on with the Palestinians. Abigail Robertson, CBN News. As highlighted in the excellent report put together by CBN that we really need to pray and to stand with uh, Jewish students across campuses as they're facing a really tough time standing up for Israel or even being Jewish on campus. And uh, this reminds me very much of the time that I was at university uh, in the mid 90s. And this is why this uh, story is important to me because not only was I proud to actually attend the University of Manchester and actually be a part of their uh, Middle Eastern Studies program where I also learned Hebrew as well. It was the first time that I came into real contact uh, with, the, uh, with Jewish students and was part of the uh, Jewish students uh, where I could share my love and my passion for Israel um, and the Jewish people with like-minded people. But also it was a, a good learning curve for me to, to go to the University of Manchester, where I was very proud of the university's associations with Haim Wiseman, who came, became the first president of Israel and organised a political Zionism after the death of uh, Theodore Herzl, the founder of the modern political Zionism, which was the political ideology that became the vehicle for the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel. And Heim Wiseman followed in the footsteps of that great man himself, Theodore Herzl. Now, when I was at university, I studied, the, I studied modern Middle Eastern history um, and also modern Hebrew. Uh, learning modern Hebrew was, was not easy because not only are you learning a brand new alphabet, you're learning two alphabets. You're learning the block al alphabet that you read and then the script, the one that you write. And many of the uh, words don't have any vowels, so you have to learn the vowels and understand what the word is. So I did uh, struggle a bit with modern Hebrew. Uh, but it gave me an opportunity uh, when I was at the University of Manchester uh, in 1996 to go to Israel for the first time to uh, attend a course known as a Kibbutz Connection that was organised and run by the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, where I would uh, study Hebrew, uh, known as the Orpan, uh, in uh, a kibbutz, a beautiful kibbutz called Kibbutz Ein Shafet, which is in the north of Israel, very close to the Megiddo uh, Junction, up on the Carmel Hills, uh, where I wanted to learn Hebrew. I wanted to experience what it's like to visit Israel, to know what it's like to understand what Israelis are going through, understand Israeli history and culture. Uh, I was one of four Europeans, and uh, the rest of the group were North American uh, Jews from different universities who were studying at the Rosenberg School of International Studies in Jerusalem for a year. So the greatest summer that I spent in my life in that summer in, in 1996. And, and I learned to uh, appreciate um, my Jewish friends and uh, have a real insight into Israel. And of course, this is when the Oslo Accords uh, had really only developed uh, three years earlier with the signing of the Oslo Accords in 1993. Benjamin Netanyahu, this was his first term in office. He just won the Israeli general election uh, back in May of uh, 1996. And to spend three months in Israel exploring the country, uh, meeting Israelis, uh, having lectures on Israeli history and Israeli politics, Israeli society, uh, was for me absolutely inspirational and I didn't want to go home. But when I did have to go home back in October, of uh, 1996. Um, Israel was under the spotlight, in particular with the opening of uh, the uh, tunnel between the Western Wall. And uh, this sparked uh, violence between the IDF and, uh, so and uh, police belonging to the Palestinian Authority. It sparked 10 days of, uh, of fights between the Israeli Defence Forces and also the uh, Palestinian Police Force. We saw major skirmishes uh, in Jerusalem and across Israel. And when you're in Israel, you just think, well, this is going on, but this is quite small. But when it, I, I returned back to the campus of the University of Manchester, what surprised me is that this conflict had actually taken root over the entire university. And I remember a story of playing football uh, with, uh, with an Egyptian who was also part of the uh, Islamic society. 
And I had a look at the, uh, the blueprint for what uh, the Islamic Society are wanting to do, and they wanted to ban JSOC, the Jewish Union, because of its association with Israel and for opening the tunnels next to the Western Wall. And I spoke to him after we played football, and I said, um, you, you're part of the uh, Islamic Society. You're looking to ban the Jewish uh, Union uh, because of its association for Israel. And I got a response saying yes. But I said, um, yeah, I've just looked at your, your uh, blueprint for taking over the Union, but haven't you got one major problem in doing this? Um, you're Muslim, aren't you? And the response was yes. Um, what are you going to do about alcohol? You guys don't drink alcohol. And uh, he gave me this response is that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to push up the price of, uh, of alcohol at the student bar and then get rid of it. So then I came up with a, a, a slogan to those uh, leaders of the, uh, of the Jewish Union to say, look, we should have this as our focus. If you don't care about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, then care about your beer. And of course, this spread like wildfire throughout the uh, campus university. In the end, they didn't even have a vote on it um, because it essentially meant that so many people were so appalled that one society tried to ban the Jewish Union because of its association with Israel. And um, so I was very proud of the time that I spent in Manchester. The first time that I really uh, developed friendships with, uh, with, uh, with my so-called Jewish students. It was the first time that I went for, to Israel. It was also an opportunity for me as well to stand up for Israel um, on a campus and to, to learn about Israel, to learn about the history of the Middle East, which has been absolutely invaluable for the work that I do now on the Middle East Report. But let's have a look at this, a brilliant video produced by CBN that tells the incredible history of the meeting between Lord Balfour, Arthur Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, and also Heim Wiseman, who went on to become the first president of Israel and the signing of the Balfour Declaration. Well, the Balfour Declaration is a decision by the British cabinet, issued on November 2nd, 1917, by which Britain committed to doing all it could to facilitate the establishment of a Jewish national home in Palestine. It may even be said to be the first document that ties nationality and peoplehood to a territory as justification um, for an act by a state. The British were part of a wartime alliance. It would have been unthinkable for them to have issued a commitment regarding territory that was being conquered from an enemy without the agreement and the acquiescence of its allies. Well, I'm going to read to you the Cambon letter, a high figure in the French Foreign Ministry. It was dated June the 4th, 1917. It would be a deed of justice and of reparation to assist by the protection of the Allied powers in the renaissance of the Jewish nationality in that land from which the people of Israel were exiled so many centuries ago. The French government, which entered this present war to defend a people wrongfully attacked and which continues the struggle to assure victory of right over might, can but feel sympathy for your cause, the triumph of which is bound up with that of the Allies. I am happy to give you herewith such assurance. Sokolov also met with Pope Benedict XV and received from him what one might say was a kind of a blessing in which uh, the Pope said that we will be good neighbors. And then in Washington, uh, Louis Brandeis approached Woodrow Wilson, and he extracted from Wilson a secret agreement to support the Balfour Declaration. Wilson even saw the actual text of the Balfour Declaration. Now, it had been clear to the Zionists that if there wasn't buy-in, certainly from the French and the Americans, there would be no British commitment. So, in a way, the Balfour Declaration is much more than a British Declaration. It's an allied declaration. And at a time when there was no United Nations, no League of Nations, the consensus of the Allies was all there was by way of international legitimacy. And uh, so the British knew when they issued it that they weren't suddenly going to be contradicted out of Paris or Washington. Quite the opposite, they would be supported. The diplomatic efforts were made to get a Japanese statement in support and one was achieved. Then there, was, then there were the independent states of Asia at the time. It was China and Thailand, Siam at the time. And both of them gave um, favorable notice 
of the Balfour Declaration. So it can be re regarded as the first step in the international legitimation of a Jewish state. The position of the Palestinians from the day the Balfour Declaration was issued was that Jews have no right to Palestine. Not a single immigrant, not a single centimeter of sovereign territory was due to the Jews. It's ironic because if you talk to Palestinians today, they will say that they have rights to Palestine unto the nth generation will have the right. This is precisely though the situation of the Jews. They left as refugees and now unto the nth generation, they maintain a memory of this place and their rights. It helped that they had a book. And in that book, it was all written. And so even when they were sitting in Poland or Russia, they still prayed for rain at the time when rain should fall in the Holy Land. The Palestinian refusal to accept that right is exemplified by their attitude towards the Balfour Declaration. It's not just a rejection of the right of Israel to a state. In 1929, when the Arabs first committed pogroms against the Jews here, their position was zero Jewish immigration because there were zero Jewish rights. And any Palestinian Arab today who says about the Balfour Declaration that it warrants an apology, it isn't just a part of history, which you may or may not regret, but warrants an apology is saying that Jews have no right to be here. So it would be wrong to conclude that the Balfour Declaration is the birth certificate of the State of Israel. Israel's Declaration of Independence is the birth certificate of the State of Israel. The Balfour Declaration made a promise. The British only partially kept the promise of the Balfour Declaration. The Jews kept the rest of that promise by their own actions. And uh, this week's uh, special guest for Behind the Headlines is Nigel Tobias, and he heads up the Zionist Central Council in Manchester, one of the oldest pro-Israel Jewish organisations in the country. Uh, Nigel, it's an absolute pleasure uh, that you can join us on Behind the Headlines today. Uh, good afternoon, Simon. Nice to talk to you again, and thank you very much for inviting me. And um, Nigel, just share your thoughts as we're discussing the um, hideous uh, burglary and the stealing of uh, two busts of Heim Wiseman, who was not only a uh, professor of chemistry at the University of Manchester, but he was also Israel's first president and he also established the Jewish agency that became the Israeli government in the years before Israel became a state prior to 48. But can you share with us how proud the Jewish community in Manchester must be to know that you had someone like Chaim Wiseman over 100 years ago as an active member in your community who went on to become Israel's first president back in 1948? Well, I'm very proud. Um, Manchester has a long history um, in supporting Zionism. Uh, Chaim Weizmann lived in Manchester. Um, he was more then known as Charles Whiteman, but he lived in Manchester between 1904 and 1934. And, you know, he's a seminal person in the history of Zionism and Manchester. And I think the crime that was committed um, was appalling for a number of reasons. Uh, he was certainly a Zionist, but he uh, was known as a biochemist and also the father of industrial fermentation. And he had 100 patents in his name. So he, you know, he's um, a very proud um, Mancunian, if you will. Um, and I think the crime was appalling on a number of levels. Absolutely. Um, but uh, you, can you share with us, uh, Nigel, the, the impact that uh, October the 7th, the worst mass terrorist attack in Israel's history and the biggest massacre against the Jewish people since the Holocaust occurred, of course, just over a year ago in southern Israel by Hamas. Can you share with us the impact that that horrific uh, terrorist attack has had on the Jewish community with this unprecedented rise in Jew hatred that we're seeing, not only in this country, but also around the world? Well, I never thought in my lifetime, I'm um, 65, so I'm a post-Holocaust child. Uh, I certainly grew up aware of the Holocaust and um, I've certainly studied it at some length, but um, you know, I was safe from the Holocaust born after it. I never thought I'd see what I'm seeing. Um, today in the world in which we live, I never thought I'd see 
um, an attempted a genocide or a trial run uh, of a genocide against the Jewish state by the terrorist organization of Hamas. And what occurred that day um, has profoundly affected uh, every single Jew and, and many non-Jews were also abducted and killed on that day. Um, Hamas didn't particularly care who they killed, slaughtered, burned, raped. Uh, it was awful and, you know, um, I have two nephews in Israel, one who, um, by um, luck, um, you know, was due to be at the Nova Festival and was due to be in a car with two of his best friends. He broke his leg, couldn't go, but the best friend was murdered and the girlfriend of the best friend was raped and murdered. So it's close for every Jew. And if you ask um, any Jew uh, how close they are, they will tell you that we have nine million relatives um, in Israel. We regard all um, Israelis, particularly Jewish Israelis, as our relatives. It's horrendous what happened. It'll never be forgotten. Um, I'll also say, if I have a moment, when I went over to um, Israel in March and I did a tour um, down south and I visited the um, kibbutzes. And for me, I am an ex kibbutznik. I was on kibbutz twice. Um, I, I, you know, I shed, I shed tears walking around the kibbutz, which was always a very peaceful um, enterprise and socialist enterprise. I'm looking at the outlines of all the dead bodies and the buildings that have been rocketed and the hand grenades that have been thrown into the children's areas. It's, it's images I'll never not see. Uh, uh, Nigel, I've, I've had a similar experience visiting uh, kibbutz near Oz and seeing the site of the Nova Music Festival on, on one of the car parks that literally held 1,300 cars that were either burnt to bits or uh, uh, were shot uh, with uh, bullet fire over the windscreens uh, and then seeing the belongings of those uh, poor innocent Israelis as well is beyond horrific. But with this unprecedented rise in Jew hatred, how has this affected ordinary Jewish life uh, up in Manchester? Because the two shouldn't be related, but we see this unprecedented attack against your community. And this is why uh, as Christian supporters of Israel, we stand with you, we stand with the people of Israel and that we fight this uh, rise of Jew hatred because we know that uh, if we don't fight this, then not only is our precious Jewish communities like yourselves under threat, but of course our entire Western way of life, our freedoms and our very democracy. Well, I completely agree with um, what you say, Simon, and I'm very grateful for the support of the non-Jewish community. And um, thank you very much for that. I, um, Manchester, we are um, a Jewish city. We're very proud of our heritage. I was born and bred in Manchester and we'll probably die in Manchester. Um, but it's difficult to, for some people, they find it very difficult to show their Jewishness because of what is going on on a daily basis. And, and, it, and it isn't anti-Zionism. It is Jew hatred. It's plain and simple. It's just now an excuse to demonstrate Jew hatred. There are people that will not wear their wagon dogs. They are taking their mezuzahs off the door. And, and this is 2024. This is not 1935. Germany. And it affects everything at Manchester University. There are demonst countless demonstrations. There was one uh, the other night where the students were getting together to discuss anti-Semitism versus anti-Zionism. Of course, that meeting was hijacked. Um, we have demonstrations on a very regular basis in Manchester. Uh, ostensibly, it's, it's about um, making um, Israel and the Jews pariahs in our own country. And uh, the Jewish community in Manchester can be very proud of its association with its former member, Haim Wiseman, who not only led the Zionist movement, but also became the first president of the modern state of Israel. He's also a, a famous British icon in the fact that he actually helped to secure victory for the British in the First World War against the Germans by producing acetone uh, that was needed in the munitions of shells for artillery. Um, that uh, to help turn the war around in Britain's favour during the First World War. And this is what gave him the political influence that he had with Arthur Balfour, who was at the time uh, the Foreign Secretary under 
uh, Lloyd George, who was the Prime Minister. And so we had a very uh, Christian evangelical cabinet um, from 1916 onwards that would make a major difference in terms of recognising uh, Israel's uh, right or the Jewish people's right to self-determination in fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Now regarding that, our friends at CBN have produced a fabulous documentary uh, entitled 67 Words That Changed the World, that tells the true story of the historic meeting between Lord Balfour and Haim Wiseman that led to the Balfour Declaration that became the birth certificate for the modern state of Israel. Take a look. On November 2nd, 1917, the British government issued a letter that promised the Jewish people their first homeland in nearly 2,000 years. And with just 67 words, the map of the world changed forever. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. In 1917, the population of Palestine was predominantly Arab, so why did the British endorse a Jewish home in a region where only 7% of the people were Jews? The Balfour Declaration wasn't issued for the Jews in Palestine. It was issued for the Jews in desperate straits outside Palestine, and in particular, the Jews of the Russian Empire. There was a huge population of Jews who were in mortal danger. At the turn of the 20th century, some 2,000 Russian Jews were killed in a wave of bloody pogroms. Fifteen years later, during World War I, 600,000 more were deported because they were suspected of being pro-German. After the war, another 50,000 died in a new series of pogroms, and half a million were left homeless. There were at the time something over five million Jews in the Russian Empire. That was a larger population than the Arab population of the entire Levant. Palestine, Syria, Lebanon included all. Still only about four million at the time. It was the maximum good for the maximum number of people. And there were people here who were in desperate need of refuge. 14 years earlier, in 1903, Zionist leaders had asked Great Britain to provide a safe haven for the Russian Jews. In response, the British offered them land in Uganda, then under British control. Ultimately, the Zionists turned down the offer, but they had caught the attention of one of the attorneys who had helped draft the so-called Uganda scheme, a parliament member with a love for biblical history. David Lloyd George had been raised in a deeply religious home in Wales, where he had studied the history of the Jewish people. He had become convinced of their right to return to their biblical homeland, and often spoke of putting Israel back on the map and providing a national hearth and a refuge for the hunted children of Israel. During World War I, Lloyd George became Britain's first Minister of Munitions, and in this capacity, he met a scientist who shared his dream of a Jewish homeland. At the height of World War I, 
Great Britain experienced a critical shortage of acetone, the chemical needed to create the explosive in artillery cartridges. So a Jewish chemist in Manchester went to work and came up with a new way to create acetone by fermenting grain, corn, and even chestnuts. He worked day and night to reproduce it in mass quantities, and soon the British were producing 90,000 gallons a year. The chemist who saved the British Army was a Russian Jewish man named Heim Weizmann, a Zionist leader who would one day become the first president of the State of Israel. Chaim Weizmann was the chief architect of Zionist diplomacy. He was the one who formulated the case, and he did it in a very persistent way. He was a man of action, totally driven, and also a charmer. And not only that, he put together a strategy. The strategy was to gain some kind of explicit endorsement of the Zionist movement, which would be a public one. In Manchester, Weizmann made a number of strategic friendships with members of the British government. During the war, he worked with Lloyd George to solve the munitions crisis. And nearly a decade earlier, he had met a former prime minister who became a lifelong friend. Coming up, the biblical basis for the letter that changed the world. The friend that Heim Weizmann made learned the Bible from an early age, and this biblical worldview laid the foundation for what many believed helped fulfill biblical prophecy. His name, Lord Arthur Balfour. Lord Arthur James Balfour was born in eastern Scotland, and like David Lloyd George, his childhood was steeped in the stories of the Bible. He came from a very, very intellectual family, and they were all very pragmatic Protestants. The Bible was pretty central to, to everybody's education. You know, they would have read the Old Testament every Sunday. So they were brought up in a very religious way, not extreme, but just with intense education about the Bible. So it was very natural for anybody who was brought up in that environment to associate the Holy Land and the Jews. They weren't inextricably linked. After several years as a member of parliament, Balfour became prime minister in 1902. While in office, he supported the plan for a Jewish homeland in Uganda. A few years later, a friend introduced him to Heim Weizmann of Manchester University. And the two debated the merits of the Uganda scheme for more than an hour. But the Russian Jews need a safe haven immediately. Why not British East Africa? The survival of Zionism is based on a spiritual conviction. And that conviction is based on Palestine. And on Palestine alone. If Moses had been here when they had proposed Uganda, he would surely have broken the tablets once again. <laughs> Mr. Balfour. Supposing I were to offer you Paris instead of London, would you take it? <laughs> but Dr. Weizmann, we have London. That is true. And we had Jerusalem when London was nothing more than a marsh. Are there many Jews who think like you? I believe I speak the mind of millions of Jews who cannot speak for themselves. If that is so, Dr. Weizmann, then you will one day be a force. Lord Balfour had gone into the meeting hoping to change Weizmann's mind, but instead, he became the convert, and the Jewish people gained an ally in one of the most powerful men in England. In 1915, Weizmann's groundbreaking production of acetone was invaluable to the British war effort. And he now had the ear of the most influential men in England. David Lloyd George later wrote in his memoirs that the Balfour Declaration was a reward for Weizmann's service to Britain. In response, Weizmann commented, 
I wish it had been as simple as that. In 1916, both of Weitzman's friends were promoted. David Lloyd George became the new prime minister, and Lord Balfour was now his foreign secretary. Together, they fought for the Zionist cause in the newly created British War Cabinet. And we still have uh, Nigel with us on this very important interview as we uh, look into the attacks on the Jewish community up in Manchester, but also the stealing of the bus belonging to Israel's first president, Haim Wiseman. Uh, so, Nigel, over the weekend, which marked the 107th anniversary of the signing of the Balfour Declaration, uh, we saw two criminals belonging to the palace group called the Palestinian Action Group uh, break into the uh, chemistry department at the University of Manchester, which was my former university, and steal two busts of Haim Wiseman, the first president of Israel. Um, share with us your, vo uh, your thoughts on this shocking behaviour designed to actually uh, raise awful PR uh, for their cause. Well, I, I think it's um, an awful crime. It's um, a very personal crime. It's um, Chaim Weizmann had a wonderful relationship with Manchester University. Um, you know, as I might have said before, um, he um, was the father um, of um, industrial fermentation. He, he developed many patents in Manchester, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a shocking crime, it's an appalling crime, and particularly in relation to Manchester University, where he was such a prominent figure, it should not have happened, and I'd like to know how it happened. And the other uh, question regarding this, this Nigel as well, is that not only was Heim Wiseman, um, the leader of the uh, Zionist movement, uh, who established the Jewish agency, that became the forerunner for the Israeli government when it was established on the 14th of May, 1948, but he was also instrumental for this country in the fact that he was asked by the government of Lloyd George to produce acetone, which was needed in British ammunition to fight against the Germans. And he had that breakthrough of producing um, acetone, which then helped turn the war effort around. So share with us his contribution, not only to helping re-establish the modern state of Israel, but also for helping Britain and the United States and the French win the First World War against the Germans? I think he was very um, instrumental uh, in supporting the British efforts in World War II. Um, it it um, might not be known so much, but it was discovered after World War II um, that the SS had um, compiled the list of 2,800 people in Britain, which included uh, Chaim Weizmann. And these people were to have been immediately um, arrested after an invasion of Britain. Ultimately, uh, the uh, operation was abandoned. It was Operation Sea Lion. So he was one of 2,800 people that the Nazis would have immediately arrested, which shows how important he was to the war effort. But also share with us as well, as we, we just mark the 107th anniversary of the signing of the Balfour Declaration, the close friendship that Heim Weissman built up with uh, Lord Balfour, who was the Foreign Secretary and who is actual signatures on the Balfour Declaration, which was essentially the birth certificate for the modern state of Israel, the first major power in the Western world to recognise uh, a Jewish homeland uh, in the heart of the Middle East, which is, of course, uh, the homeland of the Jewish people. But share with us the political significance of this friendship and how this led to the signing of the Balfour Declaration. Uh, Weitzman, I think, first met Arthur uh, Balfour, who was the Conservative um, Prime Minister, but he was also the MP for East Manchester. And Weitzman and Balfour met um, during um, an electoral campaign in 1905 and 1906. Balfour had always supported the concept of a Jewish homeland. At one point, it had been, um, I think, suggested the um, Uganda plan. Um, and Weitzman is credited with persuading Balfour, who was then by then the foreign secretary, um, in, in relation to the original um, establishment of the United States of Israel and the Zionist aspirations. Th there is a story, and I'll probably get it wrong, that um, Weitzman asked Balfour if he would give up London to live in Saskatchewan. 
and uh, Balfour replied that uh, why would he do that because Britain had always been in his home and he'd always lived in London and Weizmann is um, supposed to have responded to the effect of well yes when we lived in London when we lived in Jerusalem London was still a marsh and um, a marsh and why would you ask us to live elsewhere and I no, think I, I... Uh, absolutely. Uh, and back to this attack, and, and of course, what we've seen really since October the 7th is unprecedented wave of Jew hatred demonstrated in so many different places against the Jewish people. We've also seen, for example, the anti uh, Israel marches being taken place in London and uh, major uh, capitals, including Manchester and Birmingham and other major uh, Glasgow and Cardiff as well throughout the UK, um, which are nothing but hate marches. But, but share with us how we're seeing this like a attack on historical and cultural icons, um, including the stealing of the bus of Heim Wiseman. Uh, from the University of Manchester, as well as th of defaming the statue of the famous music uh, uh, and singer and, and writer Amy Winehouse. I don't think you can separate the anti-Zionism from the um, uh, anti-Semitism. I think that they are, um, you know, they are one and the same thing. It has now become um, a disguise to basically hide behind anti-Zionism and say it's nothing to do with the Jews, but it's everything to do with the Jews. Uh, there isn't a Jew that doesn't have an affinity with Israel. What's going on in the UK and what is being allowed to go on? Um, it, it might be too strong to say it's terrorism, but it's certainly terrorising the Jewish people who do not feel safe in their homes. They do not feel safe in their communities. And I think that um, something has to stop. When you look at the marches, and you see that they um, basically um, interpose a swastika, which, which is the, um, the worst emblem of the worst Holocaust genocide that has ever been committed, but they interpose a swastika with the Star of David, then I do not think that you can come away from these demonstrators as being anything other than proudly displaying anti-Semitism on UK streets. Absolutely. Uh, uh, and Nigel, share with us uh, your thoughts about the Palestinian Action Group and how they've really taken a leaf out of a distinct rebellion. And the fact that over the weekend, um, they also uh, threw paint um, and damaged the offices of the Jewish National Fund um, in, uh, in London, as well as uh, the offices of BICOM as well, British Israel Communications and Research Group, um, that uh, support Israel and support the Jewish people. Uh, just share with us how they are all out for publicity uh, and, and don't really care about the criminal damage that they're doing, nor do they care about the, the, the Jewish community either and how they are perceiving these horrendous criminal um, attacks on their institutions as well as cultural and political icons. I think they're very proud of what they're doing and I don't think that they are hiding away uh, from their pride. And it seems every week or every other day that they come up with a new a gimmick or idea which is to basically um, hold to account Jews um, for um, a, you know, a situation in the Middle East in which most Jews in the UK have got no particular say or vote. Um, I think they're being allowed. I don't think that um, any other cause would be allowed to continue to do what they are doing to a minority um, in the country, in any country. I cannot understand why more is not being done. Um, criminal damage um, should be prosecuted and criminal damage should be paid for. And nothing seems to be happening. We've heard nothing from um, that I am aware of from the government. Um, and I think the Keir Starmer is the Prime Minister of the UK actually should be coming out and stating very, very clearly that what is going on is gone has gone beyond and far beyond free speech. This is hate speech. There is no responsibility um, to what is being um, allowed at this moment in time. And I think if you took um, Jews out of this equation and put any other people, whether they be um, Christian, Muslim, white, black, Asian, it would not be allowed. Why is it being allowed? There must be Jewish people.
Uh, 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 Nigel, um, I'm very fond of Manchester. I spent three years up there as a student at the University of Manchester. So to be doing a programme on my former, former university where I'm very proud of its association with the uh, Jewish community. I'm very proud of the association with Heim Wiseman. Um, but sadly, when I was at university, um, the University of Manchester had the biggest uh, Jewish students union in the country. But sadly, there are very few. Just share with us the sad uh, state of affairs that we're in, where Jewish people uh, or Jewish students no longer feel that safe on campus. And, and the University of Manchester has a fraction of the Jewish students it had when I was there. And that would have been back in the 90s. I think it's very, very sad. And I, um, I think it's very, very shameful. And I think it does Manchester no credit. And I don't think it does any uh, university credit to allow what's going on. It's just the persecution of um, Jewish students who just happen to have uh, a different opinion. And in a society where free speech is supposedly allowed, why should we be quiet? It, it's quite interesting that you went to Manchester University, my um, older son went to Manchester University. And 16 years on, my younger son is looking at universities as we speak. He's doing his mock GCSEs today. And, you know, we would have loved him to go to Manchester University, but uppermost in our thoughts is the fact that he is probably not going to enjoy his time at Manchester University. Sadly, the same can be said for other universities, but Manchester is my home. Uh, we do not know whether or not he will be happy at Manchester University. Um, he's proud of his heritage, he's proud of who he is. And we always wanted him to follow in our older son's footsteps, and up until now he has. So for me, for him and for his mum, um, Manchester is not really going to be an option at this point in time. I think that's regrettable, and I think it's very, very sad, and I think it's shameful. Uh, and finally, uh, Nigel, how can our, our Christian viewers watching this programme today stand with you, stand with the Jewish community in Manchester as well as the uh, Jewish communities throughout the UK at this time of unprecedented hatred uh, that we're seeing in every aspect of life in Britain, whether it's politics in Parliament, whether it's the media, whether it's through culture and arts or whether it's in sport. Share with us how we can all make a difference and stand up to this hatred to protect our, our Jewish community, uh, which is yours? Well, um, I'm very, very grateful to the Christian community for the help and support that they are showing to the Jewish community. I think sometimes it's just the case if you see somebody with a David or a kippah or somebody that's Jewish, it's possibly just um, saying hello or smiling at them because we are badly in need of emotional support at this moment in time and joining some of the uh, marches that we have to show our pride in Israel and in the UK. More people could join us, but I think actually a really important point is the fact that, you know, if we go around wearing a Magin Dovet, start with David, a Yamoki, um, maybe just to say hello and to offer your support. Um, because emotionally, we are hurting and we aren't sure who our friends are. Um, uh, Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure that you can join us on Behind the Headlines today and uh, looking forward to getting you back in our studios uh, where you belong, which is the Middle East Report, sending you and uh, your community our love and our support. And uh, thank you for showing us the great history and the connection between Zionism, Israel and uh, the city of Manchester. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Alan. And a real honour for us to have uh, Nigel Tobias joining us from Manchester to share his thoughts on the stealing of the bus belonging to Heim Wiseman, plus the attacks on the Jewish National Fund and also BICOM by Palestinian Action Group. Now, we have this excellent video of uh, produced by friends at CBN, and this is Benjamin Netanyahu talking about how Jewish history did not start with the re-establishment of the modern state of Israel back in 1948, but how uh, Israel's history goes back to biblical times. We're talking about 4,000 years of Jewish history that led up to the creation of the modern state of Israel on the 14th of May, 1948. Take a look. Those who are in favor will say yes. Those who are against will say no. They called it the partition plan. UN Resolution 181 
called for the establishment of a Jewish state and an Arab state in British-controlled Palestine. It represented the acknowledgement of the international community of the right of the Jewish people to establish a state, also the right of the Arab people to establish a state in Palestine. The partition plan was so significant to the Jewish people that cities throughout Israel have named streets after the date. Kaf Tetba November, the 29th of November Street, like this one here in Jerusalem. In honor of the anniversary, Israel's mission to the UN celebrated by returning to the hall in Flushing Meadows, New York, where the UN vote took place. Today is the 70th anniversary of a great miracle, a miracle that was anything but guaranteed. In this very hall, when the United Nations declared to the modern world an ancient truth, that the Jewish people have a natural, irrevocable right to an independent state in their ancestral and eternal homeland. The plan set aside land in the Galilee, along the Mediterranean, and the Negev Desert for the Jewish people. The Arabs received all of biblical Judea and Samaria, later known as the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and other small portions. Perhaps the most controversial part of the plan was that an international body would control Jerusalem. Still, the Jewish people accepted the plan. The Israelis didn't like it because it didn't give them Jerusalem and it didn't give them Eilat and, and all the southern Negev. But they, they accepted it because, okay, this was the best we can get. Arabs, however, gave it a thumbs down. They not just rejected it, but they waged a war not just against the state of Israel, but against the UN resolution. Israeli Ambassador Alan Baker told CBN News, it's ironic that today Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas uses the 70-year-old resolution to call for his people's right to a Palestinian state. There was no such thing as a Palestinian people. That Then the Palestinians were the Jews living in Palestine. Uh, and, and so he, he claims that Resolution 181 is their Magna Carta for establishing a Palestinian state because it guaranteed a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. And he's misleading the international uh, community. And of course, they rejected it. Ahead of the anniversary, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said the most important thing for Israelis is remembering to connect with their past. The first need for the next 100 years is to remember the 4,000 previous ones. That is the first thing that will ensure the future of the Jewish nation in the land of Israel and the state of Israel. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. So this nation, the nation of Great Britain, can be very proud of the role that it played to help re-establish the modern state of Israel back in 1948 with the signing of the Balfour Declaration uh, back in November of 1917 and together being in control of the British mandates that would prepare the Jewish people for statehood. Sadly, uh, we saw in the 1920s the British government change its position, uh, particularly with the publications of the green and white papers that prevented Jewish immigration to the British mandate of Palestine just before the Second World War. And this country had it opened its, opened its doors to the Jewish people um, in the years prior to the Holocaust, then maybe this nation could have saved over a million precious Jewish lives from the Holocaust. We'll never know. Uh, but we know that this country did not stand with Israel or the Jewish people in their hour of need. Uh, they were unlike the leaders that we saw in Lloyd George and Lord Balfour. Now, regarding the uh, what I would describe as a cultural uh, attack on Haim Wiseman and the University of Manchester by Palestinian Action Group. I think it's important to get a response from the uh, Chancellor of the University of Manchester. Now, he has written a, a press release in which he says that on the evening of Friday the 1st of no November, intruders of the chemistry building smashed the window of the display cabinet and stole the bust of former University of Manchester academic Haim Wiseman who later became the first president of Israel, is one of several incidents committed around the country. We have notified the police who are investigating. This is an act of vandalism and makes no contribution whatsoever to a better understanding of the current conflict in the Middle East. 
One more than a year, over more, sorry, over more than a year, we've seen peaceful protest on campus and the exchange of strongly held views. We welcome this part as our fundamental role as a university, as a place dedicated to the discussion of often difficult ideas and beliefs. Alongside our deep commitment to academic freedom is our commitment to the values of community, tolerance and respect. Freedom and inclusion are the heart of everything that we do. And it wouldn't be fair unless we read a press release belonging to the Palestinian Action Group who wrote the following. They said, today, Palestinian action have marked 107 years since the Balfour Declaration by taking two sculptures of Israel's first president, Haim Wiseman, from its display case at the University of Manchester. Arthur James Balfour, a known anti-Semite, uh, met leading Zionist Haim Weizmann in Manchester, where they both lived in the first decade of the, 21st, of the 20th century. Other several meetings, Wiseman, who described Palestinians as the rocks of Judea, obstacles that had to be cleared on a difficult path, lobbied Balfour into assisting the Zionist colonization of Palestine. They said in 1917, a year after the Balfour was appointed UK Foreign Secretary, he penned the Balfour Declaration, promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine, the public pledge by Britain in the form of a letter dated the 2nd of November 1917 to Lords Rothschild, a close friend of Weissman. On behalf of Britain, Balfour promised away the land of Palestine, which he never had a right to do. But the actual fact that, that uh, you have to understand history, that the land was occupied by the Ottoman Empire for 400 years, and because the Ottomans sided with the Germans in the First World War, they became an enemy of the British, the French and the Russians therefore they were enemy of Britain and of course we saw the British and the Anzac forces liberate uh, the Holy Land from Ottoman control back in 1917 during the First World War and this is the reason it fell into British hands. We can, we have to stand up against this hatred of Israel and the Jewish people. We have to stand up against destroying historical and cultural icons like Haim Wiseman and reassure our precious Jewish communities.